Austin here today. Professor Liu is a leader in the development of uh, flexible electronics. Her uh, bachelor's bar is from Tsinghua and her PhD from Harvard University. She has multiple awards, including uh, Office of uh, Naval Research Young Investigator Award, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research uh, Young Investigator Award, and multiple others. And without further ado, welcome to Shu and uh, please, the floor is yours. First of all, I would like to uh, thank Nicholas and all the organizers for this very nice um, CCMR symposium. I uh, also learned a lot and uh, was very impressed by all the talks and it's good to see Shenhe we haven't met for a while. So um, this is a, a very brief overview of uh, our recent progress for electronic tattoos. Um, as alluded by um, many previous um, speakers already, uh, currently our human society is uh, going through the fourth industrial revolution, which is also referred as industry 4.0. Uh, this includes things like uh, robotics for sure, internet of things, artificial intelligence, big data, and so on. So it is called cyber physical systems. For human to stay relevant in this uh, AI age, uh, we have to connect our body also into this uh, cyber physical system, uh, basically just like a car, right? But currently, if you take a look at a car, thousands of sensors distributed all over the car to sense the uh, condition of the car, but rarely we have sensors on human body. But they are both machine systems, so the hard machine and the soft bio machine, uh, which are radiating um, data, uh, very personal, very continuous, distributed and multi-modal data about their health, their readiness, their intention and emotion is specifically for human, right? We're able to think, we have feelings. And uh, those data are well distributed all over the body and they are uh, highly multimodal, um, mechanical, electrical, um, thermal and uh, biochemical, right? So um, to really uh, overcome the limitations of conventional wearable devices, which are intrinsically rigid, bulky and obstructive, uh, we would like to pursue the idea of a soft tattoo-like sticker that can patch on any part of the skin for distributed and multimodal sensing, um, which are also intrinsically soft and ultra thin such that they are unobstructive and they could be wearable for longer term. So um, to create stretchable um, electronics, um, we leverage this concept of uh, a meandering uh, serpentine ribbons, uh, which is applicable to any kind of material. If you want to make any kind of material uh, soft and stretchable, uh, whether it's a silicon metal 2D material or even uh, some organic semiconductor material, uh, this is a very easy and uh, um, quick way to do it, inspired by 3D screens, of course. So leveraging this kind of uh, um, filamentary serpentine network, uh, we built the first epidermal electronics. Now I call them e-tattoos uh, to also differentiate with e-skins. And um, we are able to achieve a stiffness uh, comparable with a, a pig skin. And we're able to patch anywhere, even including highly deformable uh, neck region um, to record neck electromyogram and um, use that to control a scope and gain instead of really using your voice. But at that time, the fabrication of um, epidermal electronics or e-tattoos were very tedious using clean room facilities with photolysol, wet process, dry etching, and uh, also this uh, multiple um, transfer printing uh, techniques, which is uh, really time consuming and costly. So at UT, we are pursuing mm, this kind of uh, mm, subtractive fabrica digital fabrication using uh, mechanical or laser cutters. For mechanical cutter, it's very low cost, $300. 
but the feature is limited uh, to 250 micron, which is enough for actually a human body surface sensing, uh, not enough, for example, for neural sensing. And instead of uh, cutting a metal thin film like a aluminum foil or um, other metal foil, they are uh, very uh, easy to rupture due to strain localization and necking. Uh, we use always use metallized polymer uh, 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 um, to achieve a large stretchability, even for unpatterned, for straight ribbons for um, ribbons patterned into serpentines easily more than 100 or 200%. And uh, commercially, uh, there are a lot of those metallized polymers available in big rows where you can buy or even custom customize them. So uh, we've got uh, gold on uh, PET and we use a thermal release tape as a temporary support. Uh, we perform this so-called cut and paste method. We literally cut the patterns we import it into the software and then we just remove the extraneous part because the thermal release tape could um, be deactivated through heating and then we can paste the reminding um, uh, patterns onto target substrate which could be a tattoo paper or medical tape or human skin the process is a free form. There's no mask or template required. It's a complete dry process. It could be very large area. I will demonstrate to you. It could be multi-material. And you can do multiple cut and paste onto the same substrate uh, to have a multi-material, multi-functional system. And uh, later, I'll also show you it's also uh, potentially solderable. So this was our earlier uh, multifunctional ETA tool, purely made out of uh, gold on um, PET filamentary serpentine. But even uh, just that on um, human chest, we can measure skin temperature when we turn on a heater facing the subject, skin temperature started to increase immediately, but uh, skin started to sweat after about 10 minutes. And then um, after about another 10 minutes, um, the skin hydration saturated and which indicates like the surface is full of sweat but even under a lot of sweating we are still able to get a very high fidelity ecg like here blown up view and extract a very accurate heart rate and um, to go larger area um we know that the filamentary serpentines are very difficult to handle um but a human um body has uh, this uh, non zero Gaussian curvature everywhere. So to uh, have high fidelity transfer, we propose a concept um, inspired by a math concept called Cartan development. In 2D, it basically means when you roll a um, curved um, line onto a flat surface without friction, then they have the same length. So the strain induced by transfer is zero. In 3D, it's very similar, but now we have all the filamentary serpentines on this uh, uh, temporary support, and we are trying to transfer onto a curvilinear surface. We also adopt this kind of a rolling uh, kind of transfer or Cartan transfer. And uh, through modeling, we could easily see the Cartan transfer induces very negligible strains, 0.001%. Whereas if you do this direct transfer printing, you try to make contacts everywhere at once, it induces very large strain, even for this ultra thin filaments. And those kind of direct transfer would induce a lot of distortions and buckling or even fracture of the pattern. Whereas the Cartan transfer is able to fully preserve your original pattern. And using this, we can do multi-channel surface electrophysiology on the neck, on the chest, uh, or even on the arm. So in collaboration with Professor Yong An Huang, uh, we were able to demonstrate this 16-channel arm EMG ETA2 uh, that is able to um, achieve uh, uh, American Sign Language recognition um, purely using the surface uh, electromyograms. And then we can um, do a sign language saying hello or bye, just using this kind of system. And as you can see, we could also use it to uh, control uh, very 
detailed robotic hand motion if we need to. Um, in terms of that was a large area in terms of multi material. So here it's a very simple bi material uh, system where we have uh, gold electrodes again gold on PET for ECG sensing and we have um, PVDF serpentines for vibration sensing the surface of our chest has uh, vibration signals from our heartbeat that is called a seismocardiogram and measuring uh, ECG and SCG simultaneously and synchronously we are able to extract all kinds of cardiac time intervals such as pre-ejection period, left ventricular ejection time, systole, diastole, and so on. So there are a few studies reporting that there is a negative correlation between the systole and the blood pressure. So basically the faster our heart contracts, the higher blood pressure we have. So using this calibration curve and using our continuous bimodal cardiography measurement, we are able to uh, extract um, systolic and diastolic blood pressure beat by beat. And that can give us a, a sense of blood pressure even at a very abrupt changes. So ultimately the difference between an ETA2 and a conventional wearable like an Apple uh, watch is really the interface. Um, we know that when we have a, Apple Watch or something intrinsically thick and rigid, uh, the contact with our microscopically very uh, rough skin is not very good. And when the skin starts to deform, there's easily a lot of interfacial motion and uh, sliding. On the other hand, if we have ultra thin and ultra soft tattoos that can fully conform to the skin, then um, they have much larger contact area to reduce the contact impedance and enhance the uh, signal to noise ratio. And further, when the skin deforms, um, it will be able to deform together with the skin and um, which can reduce the motion artifacts. So uh, from mechanics modeling using energy uh, considerations, we are able to um, tell you how thin or how soft the device has to be in order to achieve conformability, uh, given the um, device stiffness, the uh, substrate stiffness, the substrate roughness, and interface adhesion. Of course, this model not only applicable to skin conformability, to any other uh, soft substrate conformability. And in this special case, um, Ecoflex uh, skin without added adhesive, just Vander Waals adhesion, uh, would require uh, less than seven micron to achieve full conformability. And experimentally by Professor Rogers, indeed at five micron, 100% conformability, at 36 micron, barely, and 100 micron, forget about it. So this is a demonstration of mm, commercial wet gel electrode versus a 13 micron tattoo versus 1.5 micron tattoo under motion uh, measuring ECG. And we can clearly see the motion uh, artifacts in uh, even the wet gel system uh, compared with uh, the dry but fully conformable E tattoo system. So um, to go to ultimate conformability, we want to use the thinnest possible material, and that's our motivation to make graphene e tattoos. So uh, after wet transfer, we are doing our conventional cut and paste process. In this case, uh, we can directly paste everything on human skin through a temporary support, which is a commercially available tattoo paper coated with water soluble adhesive. So it's exactly like how you transfer a temporary tattoo sticker to kids' skin um, by smearing some water on the back of the paper and then remove the paper. So um, in this case, we are building a 500 nanometer thick graphene e tattoo with a monolayer graphene, so 0.3 nanometer thick graphene, but 500 nanometer thick PMMA substrate. So um, the whole system is fully conformable to the skin as well as um, very transparent. So in this case, even if we put the e tattoo, the graphene e tattoo get 
on the skin, on the uh, face, um, it is uh, imperceptible, invisible. And then we can measure the uh, electro-oculogram from uh, eyeball rotation to control a drone. So the drone flies according to the eyesight of the subject. There's no camera on the drone. So in addition to graphene, um, we are also investigating some other nanomaterials. Uh, in this case, this is a, a CNT. Uh, mixed with Ecoflex uh, to facilitate the mixture. We use chloroform and also use a uh, two-step sonication. Um, and then we use a nickel foam dip into this uh, mixture and then uh, cure the composite and then um, etch away the nickel to leave the uh, um, a porous nanocomposite, which is uh, electrically conductive because of the CNT doping. And, uh, the sonication is the key. Um, with the proper sonication, uh, we're able to have very good dispersion of the carbon nanotube network. And uh, because, uh, like uh, Professor David Mooney mentioned, we have a very large and uh, high porosity, then we only need a very small uh, amount of uh, CNT, 0.2 weight percent CNT, to make the whole composite uh, electroconductive. And um, because the nickel uh, was etched, the leftover porous composite, it has uh, those uh, hollow ligaments that contributes to the high porosity. Um, so we uh, demonstrated a hybrid response pressure sensor based on the system. And we compared the system with uh, conventional uh, capacitive pressure sensors like just uh, a solid Ecoflex or a uh, slightly doped, but uh, still non-conductive Ecoflex or porous Ecoflex or porous non-conductive Ecoflex. So uh, in all those cases, uh, we uh, clearly have this so-called piezo capacitive response. But in comparison, if we use conductive uh, porous nanocomposite by adding by inserting an ultra thin insulating layer like 500 nanometer PMA, we're able to also still create a capacitive device. But this device benefits from the hybrid response of this conductive porous composite. It has both piezo resistive and piezo capacitive response. At a small pressure, uh, the response is dominated by the piezo capacitance response because the pores are shrinking. At high pressure, the ligaments also get compressed and we also get a contribution from the piezo resistive response. And therefore, this kind of hybrid response pressure sensor demonstrates very large sensitivity even at very large strain. So this is the result of a, a capacitance change versus pressure. So the pink one is the solid Ecoflex. We all know it's not very sensitive. After uh, doping uh, some like small amount of carbon nanotube, it's still not that sensitive. Making it porous could be quite effective. And uh, making it porous with somewhat uh, CNT doping to enhance the uh, K dielectric constant, it has a further effect. But from this to this is uh, the result of the hybrid response. So um, comparing the sensitivity over a large pressure range with the literature, we are able to achieve a significant enhancement, uh, especially at large pressure. So this kind of um, high sensitivity and soft um, pressure sensor could be applied for measuring all kinds of arterial pulse waveforms from a human skin surface. On the neck, uh, we are measuring the carotid artery pulse. And this is a typical arterial pressure waveform measured by invasive catheter. And this is our uh, non-invasive measurement on the skin surface. On the radial artery, on the wrist, we can also measure the uh, very similar waveforms. And uh, even under a lot of external pressure, for example, when we wear a headset, we're still able to measure this uh, uh, temporal artery pulse, which is very weak. And under a lot of pressure, it's actually very difficult to measure. But even with a preload, we're still measuring pretty good um, PTD waves 
from the temporal artery. So ultimately, we have to go wireless uh, to go mobile and ambulatory sensing. So to do that, we have to be able to solder um, microprocessors and uh, Bluetooth chips onto our ETA2 platforms. To do that, uh, we developed a solderable substrate uh, which has uh, water-soluble adhesive on a uh, capton support. And um, the capton is able to uh, survive high temperature soldering and the water soluble adhesive allows the uh, temporary support and delivery. So we can, uh, we call this a cast solder paste system and we can um, manufacture multiple layers um, for different uh, functions using this process. So in this example, we manufactured a three-layer system with a sensing layer, a radar circuit layer, and a wireless layer. So the wireless layer is generic for any kind of sensing uh, modality, and, but the radar circuit and the sensors have to match. And then after we merge all three layers, we're able to create wireless ETA tubes. And when we are done with those measurements, uh, we can also disassemble those three layers and uh, reassemble and reconfigure them. For example, especially the wireless layer that's generic, we can recycle them to build uh, other uh, ETA tools with other functionalities. So uh, here is a demonstration of the wireless reading of this ETA tool currently where you, uh, at that time where we're using NFC, near field communication, now we can even use Bluetooth with a small battery. Uh, even with those kind of rigid chips or LEDs or microprocessors, because it's like soldered and because of the serpentine design, uh, it is still mechanically robust and even waterproof. And we can do wireless uh, reading using NFC in this case. So uh, without uh, going into too much details, I also want to uh, mention that yes, uh, bioelectronics interface and attachment is uh, critical. And uh, we have been uh, trying to uh, find a dry adhesive system that is uh, highly uh, reversible and uh, um, repeatable to uh, go in the uh, bio e interface. And we looked into uh, micropillar systems inspired by Gecko and uh, microcrater systems inspired by Octopus. And uh, we have done a bunch of uh, mechanics uh, studies for the microcraters, uh, including their material effects, uh, geometry effects, and uh, ambient, like air versus underwater. But currently, uh, we are not able to uh, get as high um, adhesive as uh, li the literature reported. Uh, so we are still we still have more work to do. Compared with a uh, uh, crater, compared with the micropillar system, uh, one benefit is that craters indeed uh, generate more attachment force underwater because of the incompressibility of water. And also um, they can be achieved at a much softer material systems compared with the micropillar system. So uh, if you uh, want to know what we have done and an overview of the dry adhesives, uh, please refer to this invited review paper. Uh, with that, I want to uh, summarize for ETA2 sensing that um, they can be highly multimodal and uh, they have to be placed at the right location to measure the right thing. The conformability and interface with the skin is very important. And ultimately, we also need to do data fusion to look at not very straightforward things. Our ultimate vision is to close the loop for the Internet of Health, where uh, we can use those bioelectronics to do biomarker sensing. We can do data processing either on uh, the edge or on the cloud. And we have to uh, do data analytics and data science and then come up with diagnosis and treatment plans and even use those bioelectronics uh, which have intimate uh, contact with our bio tissue for both uh, sensing and treatment and keep the loop running in the background such that our patients could be treated even before they know they are ill. Of course, this is still a long-term vision. Uh, there are many, many challenges uh, in terms of uh, sensing modality, long-term wearability, and uh, data quality. 
Um, there are many opportunities, therefore, in materials, mechanics, electronics, biointerface, and data science. With that, I want to thank my senior collaborators um, at uh, the international collaborators at UT and in other uh, uh, universities, as well as uh, a DOD. With that, I want to acknowledge my group for doing all those uh, uh, highly interdisciplinary work. We have uh, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, material engineers, and uh, biomedical engineers, and our sponsors for sponsoring the research. A uh, conflict of interest discla disclaimer is that uh, StretchMed uh, Inc. is licensing our technology uh, for the commercialization of ETA2. And with that, I want to thank everyone for your attention. Thank you very much, Nansu, for the excellent talk and for sharing your vision, this exciting vision for uh, uh, flexible electronics. Again, uh, if there's any question from the audience, please feel free to share through the chat or raise your hand. In the meantime, I have a question. The the you saw you showed something. You showed the, some images with the EcoFlex and how they conform with the skin with different thicknesses. And I was wondering, does when, when then we embed the graphene uh, layers, does does that affect at all? Does that reduce the conformability of uh, these thin layers or not? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the conformability uh, depends highly on the thickness and the stiffness of the membrane. But uh, because we have, for example, 500 nanometer PMMA uh, plus 0.3 nanometer graphene. So graphene doesn't contribute to the mechanical stiffness of the membrane. But you did notice uh, for Ecoflex, it's uh, like seven micron or five micron. For PMMA, it has to be 500 nanometer because PMMA modulus is gigapascal and Ecoflex is just 60 kilopascal. So yes, we have to consider all the mechanical properties, interface properties, as well as surface roughness uh, to estimate or predict conformability. Thank you very much, Nan Chu. Uh, I, I don't I see a question, any... Nicholas. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, kind of long-term wearability and, and issues related to fouling. Um, do you anticipate uh, you know, that, that there could be challenges from the environment, particularly in, in any um, internal applications where, where you would get accumulation of proteins or other things that might um, uh, make it more challenging to make the kind of measurements you're, you're considering? Uh, yes, uh, we have expert about biofouling here. Professor Zhao also uh, published papers uh, using uh, actuation to um, anti-fouling. And uh, for uh, uh, implantable applications, that uh, is a big challenge. Uh, for uh, non-invasive applications, actually, we also suffer from um, sweat uh, uh, induced interface or even material degradation. So um, currently, uh, we are not really uh, doing any of that research specifically, except that we are trying to use more breathable and thinner substrates. But there are uh, other uh, active researchers trying to use um, uh, like, uh, all kinds of actuators uh, to the, uh, battle with biofouling or um, even using um, other kind of smart coatings uh, to better protect the uh, uh, internal electronics. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Nanshu, again. So uh, Arthur, if you could go ahead and uh, share your uh, 